Really, really quickly before we get started, uh, I'm Daniel Yaffe, the Chief Operating Officer from AnyRoad. Uh, welcome to Polaris by AnyRoad. Uh, we, it is a series of interviews with marketing leaders on how to build impactful, lasting relationships with consumers. For those of you who are less familiar, uh, we were founded in 2012, and we're the platform for experiential retail and for brands to scale and optimize customer experiences that change behavior. Companies like Michaels, Caruso, and Dick's Sporting Goods all count on any road to scale and leverage all of their experiential records from activations to appointments to tours and classes. If your brand is investing in experiential, please check out our website or reach out to talk to us. Our guest today is Melissa Minko, Director of Retail Strategy at CINT. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so much to get through. Uh, you are a retail futurist. Uh, I, before we get to that, I would love to hear what is CINT? Um, tell us a little bit about the organization, just to place the conversation and make sure that our listeners uh, have full context. Yeah, absolutely. So CINT is a global digital specialist creating tailored customer-centric solutions for life sciences, financial services, media, CPG, and retail companies. In the retail space specifically, what that means is it could look like, like app or website modernization, CDP or cloud migration work, um, but all with a strategic innovative approach, of course. Um, and my work at CINT specifically, I'm responsible for shaping our go-to-market strategy in retail and for all of our thought leadership. So if you've read any of our white papers, um, any of our mini vertical papers, or if you've seen um, someone speak at a retail conference, it's likely me from CINT, and I'm just there to represent our thought leadership um, and our strategy in the retail space. Awesome. I, I, I'd love if you can explain what a retail futurist is and how does one become a retail futurist? I would imagine you're not going to the future and coming back and telling us about it. No, I wish. That would be really cool. Um, <laughs> but no. um, I personally, so my approach is a little bit unconventional, my methodology. Um, I like to borrow from categories outside of retail. So I get inspired by the art space, by pop culture, by QSR, automotives, you name it, uh, anything that isn't necessarily retail, just to better understand what the implications could look like if retail got really creative, because it tends to be this kind of echo chamber of ideas, and a lot of times bogged down just by what's immediately feasible versus what's idealistic and, you know, what's our hoped for outcome if we attempted something. So, I like to say, you know, things that are different. I'm not focused necessarily on being disruptive, but I do want to say things and come up with ideas that people aren't necessarily speaking about because that's, of course, where the opportunity is. And I also really like to learn from foreign markets because there are so many countries out there that are way ahead of what the U.S. is doing in the retail space. And a lot of times we just, for whatever reason, don't consider a certain country as developed and then we don't look to them for inspiration. But the reality is they're doing very cool things all over the world uh, in the retail space. And I like to see how we could add a little nuance and apply that um, to the US. So in terms of how one becomes a retail futurist, uh, yeah, it doesn't really require a, a time machine or a rocket ship, um, but it's just kind of not worrying about the details or the feasibility up front. It's really just kind of imagining those ideals first and then working out later on how to help a company actually action that innovation. Um, and I also just, I really like to look at problems that have similar end results. So think about like sustainability, for example, the goal there is often to protect the environment, but there are also problems consumers have with just not wanting to generate as much waste or spend as much money. And you can oftentimes use the same solution for a bunch of different problems. So just being really creative uh, in, in all walks and applying that to the retail space. That's awesome. Uh, what, what markets like internationally do you look to most? Like which ones might be the most surprising or the most futuristic, if, if you will? Sure. So our founders are from Brazil. So I actually, I mean, we have so many colleagues in Brazil. So I have, you know, immediate access to a wonderfully brilliant focus group there uh, where I can ask them questions and, and learn what's going on there. And when there isn't a global pandemic 
going on, I can go visit myself uh, fairly easily. Um, Pre-pandemic, I was also visiting Korea. I really enjoyed looking at the Korean market, especially for beauty, because they're always innovating ahead of the US. Um, I have not been to China yet personally, but I'm always looking to see just what brands are doing there and how they're playing, because especially with things like live streaming, where brands still haven't totally mastered it in the US, that's obviously something that really took off in China and was completely figured out. Same with chat commerce. So um, those, and then I also have a really good friend in India who provides me some great insights as well and just kind of tells me what's going on and, and where the innovation is happening in delivery there, which um, obviously, you know, the, the market in India is so diverse and so vast because of how large of a company or country it is and how um, just vast and densely populated so many of those cities are. So uh, retailers there really have to come up with solutions that some cities in the U.S. could really benefit from. That's awesome. That's awesome. So we're at the very beginning of 2022. Uh, I don't think anybody would think January would look like this. I think uh, as we rounded into Q4, I think folks thought we would maybe be in a little bit of a different place, uh, but also hopefully the future is bright. I'm curious what you think 2022 looks like. What, what is that future uh, in the short term? Yeah, I'm smiling and laughing because I can't cry anymore about all of this. <laughs> everyone else is in a similar boat. Um, definitely not happy with what's going on, of course, but um, I'm sure you'll be excited to hear this and I'm sure you also agree. I do truly believe that experiential is and forever will be a key trend um, in 2022 and beyond just because experiences have become so sacred to us. They've really been something that's been kind of taken away because of COVID and um, it's, it's almost become this, you know, uh, currency or merit badge for consumers where it's really exciting if you can go have a shared experience with someone else and it's not seen as uh, if it's sponsored as, you know, developing this kind of inauthentic relationship with a brand, it's truly something that consumers are excited about and a way that they want to connect with brands and will be welcoming that back as soon as they can. So um, I know I was able to thankfully have some meaningful experiences over the past two years when, you know, surges would kind of die down. Um, and I, I think hopefully this current surge will die down pretty soon. And then we can get back to some really fun and innovative and exciting experiences, um, of course, while feeling safe. Um, but yeah, I, I also just think expertise from associates is a really interesting concept. And it speaks to part of this experiential idea, but it's just something that consumers are really craving because we now have so many tools at our fingertips to conduct our own research, but there's still so much we just can't do ourselves. So I'm actually in the process of moving right now and I needed a new couch for my new space. Um, brands like Interior Define, for example, are really great at, even though I didn't end up going with them, so this is not, you know, like a paid advertisement for them <laughs> by any means, um, they're, they're really great at having a sales associate walk you through that whole process of measuring and figuring out what dimensions make the most sense and what type of fabric would make the most sense given that I have a dog. So um, expertise really matters moving forward because there's still only so much that machines can actually do for us. And uh, what the tools we have at the ready can really help us accomplish. So Super um, I always see that as part of the experience too. Yes. Right? Like, like if you're going to a retailer and, and they're teaching you something about the product, I, like I absolutely love that. I, I think about REI, I'm a big REI fan. When I go, I love talking to them about new products, what they have, and that's part of the experience, even though it's not maybe a built experience, um, they're making sure that their staff is informed and it's impacting my purchase behavior too. Definitely. If it's a category that you're excited about or you have a reason to be excited about it, I wouldn't say I normally in the past was excited about buying a couch, but this time it's, you know, the first place that I'm owning and it's a rite of passage in a lot of ways. Previous couches, I was not going to invest much in. I wasn't expecting to have them for the long term. It, it matters a lot. So it is part of that experience. It's actually something that I will always remember and brought my mom along with me and, you know, cause she's been the interior design queen forever. So I, I trust her. Uh, but even then we still needed an expert and wanted to have that kind of two-way dialogue for sure. Um, I also really want to mention apps, just heavy app downloading and usage. Uh, we just conducted our connected retail uh, consumer insights research for the report that's coming out next week, actually. And what we saw was that when online shopping 
shopping. So that's any form of digital shopping. Consumers were most likely to prefer using an app to uh, do the whole or facilitate the whole shopping process. This is something that's very new. We've seen retailers launch and develop apps for literally, I'd say a decade just about, and consumers were not excited about them. They didn't wanna take up precious real estate on their phones with those apps, but now consumers are ready to use them. They're understanding and willing to admit that they're leveraging the same retailers and visiting them over and over again. And it actually makes sense to be tapping into those apps to download them and to repeatedly use them, whether that's you know for discounts or to have an easy chat experience or to even just have an optimized search function available to them. And that's what I know you and I are really excited about this from an experiential perspective, but that's a great way to kind of bridge that gap between digital and physical. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think the the future of apps will look potentially really different as well, especially with wearables and other ways to, to engage. Absolutely. And then the last thing that I just think is interesting is the metaverse. I'm not going to pretend that I understand it fully, and I don't know when I actually will. And I honestly think most retailers, at least in hearing the ways that they're talking about it, don't fully understand it just yet. Uh, but I was just on Twitter before this conversation, and I did see uh, that the CEO of DoorDash just announced that he's joining the Meta board. So you can see retailers are, are starting to think about this. They're starting to figure it out. Nike has definitely been a first mover in just trying to tap into this metaverse and what it actually means. And I do think this also is actually another manifestation of experiential, because experiential doesn't have to be physically in person, it can be virtually in person as well. As a futurist, do you think that this concept of the metaverse is completely overblown and it's just going to be a, a short lived second life or third life, if you will? <laughs> uh, and then, you know, there's going to be some a handful of folks that are living in this VR world and, and buying things. Or do you think there's something there that will last? Yeah, so I want to say it's overblown. And the first week that it was announced, the amount of times I rolled my eyes was just, I mean, I, I really thought they were going to get stuck up there for a second. <laughs> but the more I'm reading and the more I'm seeing brands starting slowly to figure it out, or at least come up with their own renditions of how they'll play there, I think it does make more and more sense. So Forever 21, for example, has this kind of virtual store and they're allowing shoppers to come in and customize their own t-shirts and then have each other kind of vote on which outfits they like and which ones they would buy. And then Forever 21 gets to know which ones are actually worth producing. And in a way, this can actually also solve that sustainability issue a little bit because we're not producing items that consumers don't want or that we don't think that there's actual demand for. So it does seem like kind of a glorified, at least the way some brands are interacting with it, a glorified digital focus group. But I don't think that's such a bad thing because we do have to figure out how brands can continue to stay really close to consumers in this increasingly digital world. That being said, I don't want our whole worlds to be virtual. I think there needs to be elements of virtual that are elements that we just can't experience in a physical world. Otherwise, we should just be getting outside our houses and, and partaking in those activities in person. Um, but I, I don't think it's, I, I mean, I, I think it's overblown in some ways and not overblown in others, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah. are your thoughts on it? Were it you the early days. Um, I, you, you might sense a, a bit of my skepticism. No, I, I, look, I, I think there are use cases. I, I think it goes along with all of Web3 and crypto that there are some amazing, very effective use cases. Mm -hmm. But this concept, uh, and I think there's been a bit of like brand FOMO, frankly, yeah. of jumping in, wanting to figure out like, how do I create digital versions of my products and sell them? And what does this look like? And how do I join the metaverse? And I think that I, I may be wrong and I'll be mm -hmm. the first one to say I'm wrong. Uh, but I, I do think this concept of us, you know, spending a lot of time in the, in the digital world, um, is not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I think again, there's, there's use cases. I mean, I think people looked at the internet years ago and said, people aren't going to spend that much time on the internet. It's all digital. It's all two dimensional. Um, you know, and they were absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I think that it's, uh, uh, 
people are thinking a lot bigger than than I think it's actually going to end up being. I think there will be absolutely use cases, and I and I love that use case of customizing T-shirts. Uh, and I and I can see that. I think there's a way to interact and, and build community in digital spaces where it's not just like a 2D screen or that that are interactive that you can buy things and, and move around. So we'll see we'll see where it goes. Uh, yeah. I think it'll be it'll be an interesting few years for sure. Definitely. Well, and to your point, use cases. I mean. Prior to the pandemic, we were all laughing about QR codes years and years ago and thinking there was no need for them. They were ridiculous. They totally became extinct. And then all of a sudden this pandemic happens and they're everywhere and they're useful and it makes sense. So I don't know. I actually had this really weird thought the other day when I was watching Don't Look Up. Have you seen that movie yet? I have, yes. Okay. So I, I was thinking... I, I wondered if this was what they were trying to say, but basically if the metaverse is the solution to us ceasing to exist in a world with climate change, because if we can create ourselves in a digital world, then we don't have to worry about no longer existing in physical form, which just, it made me so depressed, but I- oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I, well, I, I hope coming from a futurist that that doesn't become a uh, reality. <laughs> I didn't say I'm an oracle, so it, hopefully it doesn't. I, I just, these are just things I like to kind of toy around with. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> um, what exciting things have you been seeing though in the world of experiential? You are obviously the experiential expert. Yeah, uh, from a retail perspective, I think a lot of companies are actually going back to the drawing table. So COVID has had this really interesting impact where pre-COVID a lot of brands said, how do we tack on experiential? How do we do a class? How do we do something else? Uh, and then what happened is COVID, of course, you know, people saw they had to, they had to adapt, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Very, very quickly. And I think there's a lot of stores. Some of these were, were doing this before COVID, but you look at like Dick's Sporting Goods, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're rethinking experiential from the ground up, right? So it's not just, hey, how do we add some experiences, some services to our store, but how do we come, become a, an experiential company? Mm -hmm. uh, they built Dick's House, House of Sport where you can go rock climbing and you can do batting cages. And of course it has a retail backbone. Mm -hmm. uh, REI, same thing. They're investing more and more in becoming an experiential company. So they're doing, they're doing trips. So you can, you, your first intro to REI can be uh, trekking, trekking in uh, South America. So right. cool. Maybe not during COVID, but yeah, you, they do camping trips and, and classes in store. Um, we're seeing a lot of a lot of pop-up shops, like stores within stores. Ulta is mm -hmm. doing shops in shops, uh, I believe in Target. So there's a lot of like interesting concepts coming up, uh, and people are saying, well, let's rethink this ground up. Like, how do we actually change as a company, and how do we interact with our consumers very differently? Uh, which is which is cool, and I think that's going to continue. And I think there you can even see like the camps of the world camp. Uh, the, the retailer yeah. uh, is an example of that. And I think it's going to be just fueled by the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. it's an experiential store in concept first. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm excited for that. Honestly, I, I mean, this month I'm, I'm feeling very kind of pent up and back to square one a little bit, but I, come February, hopefully when the surge is down, I'm really excited for those types of experiences all over again. And I know I'm not alone. For yeah, sure. hundred percent. I'm curious, from your perspective, are there retailers that have made a big impression on you from an experiential standpoint? What are you seeing? Who's leading the pack? Ugh, they're all in New York, which is a bummer for me who lives in Chicago, but I do make it a point to go to New York um, at least twice a year for this reason, because the, the best retail scene in the U.S., I, I believe, exists there. So um, one, my favorite example is Showfields. I discovered them probably I want to say t either 20, yeah, probably 2017 at this rate. Um, if, if that's possible, it just seems like so long ago. Um, but basically what they do is they created kind of a museum out of retailers uh, that are DTC brands and they rotate those retailers or those tenants um, every so often. And they have three floors. They even have a slide that takes you from the third floor back down to the first floor, which is super fun. Um, and I'm sorry for anyone if I just spoiled that little surprise for you if you end up going there, but it, it's still very fun, even if you know what to expect with that. Uh, but the store within stores there, it's kind of like a new age uh, department store in the sense that you get to develop these really cool long lasting relationships with their tenants or with the brands because they put the history of the brand uh, on like a, a tablet 
on the wall. They tell you that heritage behind it or that story. You get to sample those items and then and touch, feel, see, interact with them. And then you get to take home, you know, whatever you'd want. You do have to pay for it, but you get to take home whatever you enjoyed experiencing from there. And they have a specifically dedicated area with all of the brand's inventory. So the inventory isn't in the exact same spot that you're demoing the items, which I think is a very kind of modern twist on a department store in that way. But it's just really fun because they also bring in artists to create installations that are unique and representative of each brand. So very, very cool. Um, the Allure store I got to visit this past October in New York, which Allure, the magazine, uh, has created. And basically what they allow you to do is use that QR code that I just mentioned. Um, and whenever you see an item, it's mostly beauty products in there and wellness products. But whenever you see an item in there that you really like, you just take your phone out, scan the QR code. It tells you the rating that it got by the Allure editors because they're very well known for their uh, ranking system. And it just tells you all the details that you would ever need to know about that item. And then you can check out on your phone without downloading a separate payments app. And then someone will go grab that item for you. So that I thought was a really cool combination of being able to demo and experience the product in person, but using your phone and doing kind of that contactless payment and also digital research while simultaneously being in person. And then on the very other end, super analog spectrum uh, was Vintage Twin in New York. And it's a vintage store. So most of their clothing is recycled or upcycled, but they do have this genius. And it's this woman who is there, I think every day. And she'll literally just look at your waist. And in five seconds after assessing what your size is likely, She'll go behind the scenes, grab a few pairs of jeans, bring them out for you, and they do fit every single time. And then she'll tell you how she would alter them to just kind of customize them and really make them your own. But they fit you on the first try, which is wild and just kind of speaks back to that idea of experiential being about that expertise that a sales associate can provide that a computer can't at this point. Totally. Super interesting. Um Speaking of computers, uh, I mean, we're, we're, a, we're a data platform at our heart, right? We, we work with a lot of brands that leverage the data to understand what's working, what's not. I'm curious what you've seen in retailers doing uh, experiences and in that space, like how, how are they using measurement to drive the impact of experiences? How are they determining, you know, what's effective or what's not? Yeah, I mean, measurement has always been kind of the name of the game, but always very difficult in retail, especially because you may see something you like online and then go into the physical store, but the retailer previously didn't really have any idea of knowing that you had seen that item online. So that's where I really am excited now that consumers are using apps more than they have before and that they're open to it because apps will allow retailers to really track that data better. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of beacon technology at the moment, just because I think U.S. consumers in particular are still not fully comfortable feeling like they're being watched by brands. So I think the more retailers can really try to have consumers opt in, the better. And that's why I think really the future of loyalty programs is actually using data as the currency instead of spend. So if you as a consumer, for example, are willing to offer up you know, five data points about yourself that the retailer couldn't just collect organically from you, then you win some rewards or some perks. I think the more we focus on that kind of opt-in data, not only do retailers build stronger connections with consumers, but consumers get more and more comfortable giving that data to retailers. So, and, and it's also very trackable and there's that incentive for it to be accurate data too, because a huge issue is, you know, we have all this data, but how accurate is some of it? Um, and, and there's some trickiness there too. Totally. We, we talk about that value exchange a lot, right? Mm -hmm. The value exchange where you're giving consumers value in experience, a class, a workshop uh, in, in exchange for their, their personal information. And we're saying that more and more. And like, that is a value exchange that people feel really comfortable with. Exactly. Yeah. What's kind of, what else would you say about your philosophy on, on data at any road? Yeah. One of the things we always talk about is you have to understand who your consumers are before mm -hmm. you talk about impact. 
right? You and I mo might both go into a store, uh, the same store, right? We might both go into an Under Armour store uh, and we might have two very different experiences, right? Maybe you're a huge fan and you're a runner and I'm not, right? And I'm new. So understanding the context of who consumers are when you talk about their contextual data can help you both personalize the experience, but also understand the impact more, right? And, and maybe they build out an experience that's really effective for you or, or you know, the Melissa's of the world, but is not effective for the Daniels of the world. Well, they, right. they need to really understand that, right? It's not just one dimensional. Right? We often talk about one dimensional metrics and three dimensional metrics, right? One dimensional metrics are how many people came into the store or how many people came in through this experience. And three dimensional metrics are how did it actually impact you? Right? Is, are you a new consumer that you were brought in and now you're a big fan of the brand? Or did it impact your purchase behavior? Hopefully up, but also it could be down <laughs> and making sure that you're actually capturing that as well. So a lot of brands are using uh, our Atlas platform to gather all of these data points and put them together, right? Looking at our modeling to understand, well, what is working for which consumers and how do we get more Melissa's into the store or look like audiences like Melissa to make sure that we're, we're leveraging our experiences in the right way. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I think, and that just reminds me too, how so many brands previously, especially when social media was first starting out, were focused on things like how many people are following our brand versus how many people are actually engaging and, and sharing. And so that's another example of like that opt-in metric and how metrics don't exist in a vacuum. And you really kind of have to look at how they all play together. So I, I always recommend that retailers look at things like the overall basket mm -hmm. instead of just a one purchase in isolation, or instead of looking at a one-time purchase, looking at, you know, how frequently are they repeat buying? So just things like that too, I think are really key to your point. A hundred percent. And, and, and frequency of buying loyalty, right? That's all about loyalty. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we always say that uh, actually, one of our advisors, uh, chief, the former chief growth officer of Coca-Cola says, you can advertise to somebody all day, every day, right? If you can advertise Coca-Cola you know, Coca products, um, but it isn't until somebody has an experience do they become a loyal fan. Yes. I'm a big, like, I think about that all the time. I get Instagram ads all the time and I'm not going to just click on one and become a loyal fan. Like I need to experience the brand. Absolutely. 100%. Cool. I, I want to get to some questions yeah. uh, from our listeners in a second. So if you do have any questions, feel free to chat them uh, in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, but before we get there, putting on your futurist hat, jumping, <laughs> the, jumping into the DeLorean, uh, what, are, what are some things on your predictions list? Um, I'd love to hear both this next year, but also let's jump ahead to 2100, so 80 years from now, like maybe very few, very few people uh, who are listening are, are are still alive at that point. But maybe life extension, and maybe we're sitting here as uh, two hundred year olds. But I'm no, but I'm curious both on the short term, like in the next year or two as we come out of the pandemic. But I'm also really curious, very long term. How do you think that's going to look like to become a be a consumer or be a retailer in 75, 80 years? Yeah, I think I'll start very long term, and then I'll go back to the next couple of years. So. I think very long term is where that metaverse really does come into play because I just think figuring out what the meshing and intertwining of virtual and physical looks like beyond what we're doing right now. I mean, it's one thing to say omni channel, omni channel, omni channel, which is exactly what is salient right now. But, you know, 100 years from now, it's going to look completely different for sure. Um, so, if hopefully civilization still exists. And I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, I promise I'm a very optimistic human. Um, <laughs> but I think just figuring out what those worlds look like and, and how they actually collide is going to matter a lot for retailers because what we've been seeing right now is that physical stores are evolving to exist just to favor an online strategy. And that's what Omnichannel looks like right now. But when you hear someone like Mark Zuckerberg saying that, metaverse actually starts with the physical store, then we have to work backwards. And I'm not saying he's always right because he's definitely done a lot of things wrong, but I do think we could see it flip completely where we start with physical and digital ends up adapting to accommodate physical. And so we're kind of centering now the new omni-channel strategy around physical. 
So I think this will take a very, very, very long time because for now we're seeing the exact opposite of that and a centering of digital. Um, but I am curious to see what it would look like if physical were centered um, and, and digital were revolving around physical instead. So that's kind of, yeah. <laughs> cool. And, and then what about short term? Yes. And then short term. So beyond things like database loyalty programs, which I'm really passionate about, and I think we need to start seeing soon, um, I would say visual search will be really important and simultaneously vo voice technology. So I have been a hater of voice technology for so long, but um, I want to say it's Blue Apron. There's now a meal prep company that has started using voice tech when you're cooking their recipes. And that I thought was absolutely genius because the number of times when I'm cooking and I make it sound like I'm cooking all the time and that's not true, but we'll, we'll live in that fantasy world for a second. The amount of times I'm cooking and I have a recipe up, but then my phone screen blacks out because, you know, I'm going over to the pot and I'm not looking at my phone and I'm frustrated because now my hands are all dirty. It would be amazing to use voice technology in that moment. And to your point 10 minutes ago about use cases, I think retailers really hadn't figured out the right use case for voice technology because it wasn't intuitive for consumers and retailers didn't really try to make it intuitive or try to integrate it in an intuitive way. So I do think in the next couple of years, there will be more brands like if it's Blue Apron or other meal prep companies figuring that out like, oh, we're actually a really good match for voice technology and integrating that. So that's one thing. And then visual search as well. Uh, just we have become such a visual society because of social media and synesthesia and, and how multi-sensory we are. And so a lot of times we're trying to find an item that we want to buy and we know in our heads exactly how we want it to look, but we can't find it because we start typing all these really specific words and we just can't get there. So I do think that being able to just upload a picture of exactly what we're looking for. We've seen a few retailers try this. I know ASOS was doing something like this a little while ago, but I just think visual search will definitely mainstream. Um, and then pre-entering info digitally for an optimal in-person experience. So um, think, for example, using a retailer's app, especially in like apparel or the home setting and saying what the dimensions are you want on a garment, or what the dimensions are that you want on a sofa, and then just going into a physical store. And because you use their app, they've already seen that you've entered because they're collecting that data since you've opted in via the app. And they're already showing you automatically what inventory is relevant to the dimensions that you need. Um, so that kind of like a hybrid mode, I think we'll start seeing. And then lastly, I haven't seen any brands do this. so. If anyone wants to start working on an idea I have, I think this would be really great, is uh, collaborative shopping carts or collaborative online experiences. So if I could just list the five most important decision makers in my life on my account with ASOS or Zara, and they can always see what I'm adding to my shopping cart and they can upvote it or downvote it, I would love that. Because I have different tastes than my sister. She is way more fashion forward than I am in some ways. And especially when I'm buying certain things, I would love for her to be upvoting and downvoting things like sneakers for me. But there's no way to do that right now. I just have to send her a picture and wait for her to take you know five hours to respond to me because she's too cool. So I think we need to have this kind of ongoing shopping cart dialogue with the key decision makers or key stakeholders opinions that we value in our personal lives. That's super interesting. I'm sure somebody on the call is gonna uh, jump in and, and start, <laughs> start building that right now. Or start, Looks uh, like Jody is on it already. Awesome. Yeah, awesome, <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, cool. There, there are already some questions. I, I didn't realize that people had been chatting in a little bit already. Um, I'm shocked at the state of apps being preferred shopping experience. Do you think it's because of a better UX uh, user experience than mobile browsing shopping? 100%. And I also think it's just usually if you're downloading a retailer's app, it's because it's a retailer that you're frequenting often. So you're, you're already kind of bought in and committed to that retailer. So you're, you're there, you're, you're bought in for sure. Interesting. It makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, let me go to some of these other questions. Um, we have 
Sorry, bringing this up. Uh, we have from Sierra Valor, uh, what should retailers be doing this year to show their customers they care about sustainability? Um, and also sustainability um, with, with your dark outlook on the, on the state of humanity and existence. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm curious, how does sustainability play into any or all of this? Yeah, so sustainability is super important. I, I really, really, really believe that. I'm writing some research on it uh, in Q2 for us and doing a consumer survey right now, actually, on the topic to just try to figure out if consumers are starting to care more and more. Um, but I, I just think, so I don't mean to bash, but we did see Allbirds IPO the beginning or the end of uh, 2021. So the beginning of, of this year, basically. And um, they came out with a framework because they couldn't use the term sustainability, I guess, um, because of IPO language. And uh, the framework they came out with had four points. And I haven't seen a lot of detail on those four points. I would love to be working with companies like this on these types of frameworks because I think it's similar to the metaverse in the sense that we know it's relevant, we know it's important, but we don't know exactly how to approach it. And so few companies at this point have hired people like a chief sustainability officer. I would love to see that. Um, and as I kind of mentioned earlier too, when you solve for sustainability and you make your business more sustainable, you solve a lot of other pain points. So, you know, you solve for supply chain delays, you solve for stockouts that frustrate consumers, you solve for waste that consumers don't end up having to deal with when they have to take out the trash. Like there's just, you save them a lot of money, even though that hasn't totally been translated to consumers yet. It's, it's kind of been misunderstood, I think. So um, I think sustainability needs to be like the topic of 2022 and beyond. And I would love to see more brands figuring it out instead of just talking about how important it is. Totally, Green, greenwashing everything. Uh, yes. This is actually super relevant then from Jane Eagles. Uh, which categories do you think will be most impacted by an anti-consumption movement? What are threats and opportunities? I would imagine that's kind of tied into sustainability and, and that's you know anti-consumption because it's bad for the world. Definitely. Well, I think it's interesting because the, the wording was impacted. And I think a lot of times we assume that means impacted negatively, like which companies or categories will consumers stop frequenting or, or giving their business to. But I, I'm glad that they mentioned opportunities as well, because there are a lot of opportunities. There are a lot of great resale and, and upcycling brands. And even Nike and Lululemon have gotten into figuring out how to upcycle their own clothing and like take charge of that. Um, I mean, we've seen brands like, you know, Poshmark be making waves for this reason um, as a resale application or, or platform. So I think there's a lot, I hope there's a lot more opportunity than there are threats because every company can play here in some way. And I, again, don't mean just by talking about it, but by actually figuring something out, whether that's, you know, coming up with a criteria that they'll use to vet their suppliers better or uh, coming up with a way to manage their waste better. I mean, there are just, there are so many options for sure. So, um, but back to the question, I guess, what categories or, or brands do I think will be most impacted? I think any brands that are doing a great job figuring out recycling and upcycling will be positively impacted for sure. Um, and I think in terms of brands that may suffer the most, um, I, again, like I, I don't think anyone has to suffer, to be honest. I think fast fashion is the obvious category that could suffer, but they don't have to. They could figure this out. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I, I would imagine also the brands that have, I don't want to use the word sustainable, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> long lasting uh, wear, right? I'm thinking about the Patagonia, mm -hmm. Patagonias of the world, right? Uh, I, I think consumers, if there is an anti-consumption movement, uh, those consumers are really going to be reaching for things that'll last a while. I mean, mm -hmm. I buy a t-shirt now, I know it's going to last, you know, six to nine months and then they'll stretch out and have holes in it. And, uh, but if you, you know, there's, there's brands that will last a, a lot longer. Uh, yeah. Maybe there'll, there'll be a swing back to that, that there was back in the day. Exactly. Um, cool. Uh, you got one more question. Uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap in a second, but from Fabiana Steele, 
Uh, what is the most important trend for 2022 in the beauty segment? So beauty is tricky. Uh, we actually have, as a company, we're doing a beauty day in March for this exact reason, like a, a digital forum on beauty. Uh, it's tricky because beauty has been ahead for so long. They were doing, they were using AI before any other category really was. They started doing virtual consultations before anyone else. They were in the experiential space before a lot of people. Sephora was doing those amazing classes in their stores. Uh, and having, you know, fostering really great brand loyalty with those experiences. So I am wondering what's next for beauty because they have been, I think, using this time during the pandemic to kind of let other categories catch up because they were already kind of ready for a lot of what's been going on. So I don't like to say I don't know, but I'm going to be very honest and say I don't know. <laughs> Super interesting. One of the things that we're seeing is a lot of these, you're right there at the forefront. Uh, I think when we think about a maturity curve, they're brands that are doing experiences. Mm -hmm. And now there's that moment, especially in the pandemic, where they're saying, let's connect all this, these data points. Let's understand yeah. really what's going on. Like they created the experience, they crafted the experience, and now it's, let's actually dive below the surface. Let's get under the hood and make sure that uh, we're creating the right experiences for the right people. Like the personalization of experience. Yes, that's a great point, especially because of all the categories, it makes the most sense for them to ask for really personal data and information. Because if you want things like skin tone matching and you know skin texture matching, stuff like that, I mean, you, you have to get pretty in someone's business to find those things out and consumers have to opt into that. So you already have this trackable data and you know that this is a experience hungry consumer because there's so much pomp and circumstance around beauty. It's so fun. So I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. We are out of time, but I got one last question. Uh, if I'm a retailer right now, I'm doing budgeting. Maybe my quarter starts uh, at the end of the month, like a lot of retailers. I'm budgeting for 2022. I'm thinking about uh, planning for the year. What's your advice? I mean, definitely focus on sustainability and, and put some budget aside for that specifically and to hire the right people, the knowledge experts um, for that. And then also just really figure out how to keep close to your consumer. Um, the UK delivery service Deliveroo just opened up their own small pizza parlor so that they can use themselves to deliver their pizza and see where the issues are for their customer. And I mean, talk about getting close to your customer. I would love to see retailers get really creative with their consumers and, and doing something like that too. So use your budget that way as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you for everyone for, for tuning in and have a wonderful rest of your week. Stay healthy, stay safe, take care. Thanks for having me. Bye.